the thing I saw Ryan Reynolds do was in aviation gym when he, because Ryan found that, that high level of success in his forties. And when he sold aviation gin for a large number, it was like a 630 million bucks. And like, he did that in like two or three years, whatever it was, he Boom. was getting on the phone with fucking truck drivers, calling them up on like a Tuesday, like, Hey, it's a uh, Ryan Reynolds. They're like, quick. They'd, <laughs> they'd be like, they wouldn't believe it. He could be like, no, and they, he'd get on FaceTime or whatever. They'd be like, Holy shit. And he'd be like, we have this big deal going through. We need this route. Like, can you come through big? And they go go fucking do it. And then when he sold every one of those guys, they all, they all got a little present. Let's put it that way. Like, that's what I call. That's what I call. That's the real shit right there. Not where like, you know, um, uh, Tom, I don't want to say name Tom Brady's doing a mattress deal. And suddenly like, they can't get a point. Like it's done. Like, the whole name of this game is engagement. And that even in the fitness space now, you see people that are honestly terrible at what they do. Like there are coaches out there that are awful at what they do, but they engage. Right. Yeah. Like, you don't have to be great at what you do anymore. It's sad. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting tactic where the engagement's king, not even the quality of the content. The, what I mean, but- it sucks because I'm I'm a purist. Like I've been a, I've been a coach. For over 25 years, I've coached over 40,000 one hour sessions. I still take courses. I still have coaching men. I still have people I learn from. I love it. But there are people out there that are diving into it and they just, you know, they're influencers and that's fine. Good for them. I tell other coaches, learn from why they're, they're successful. Like there's a reason why. Sure. They, they, they can't do a goblet squat correctly. They don't know what a kettlebell swing is like, that's fine. But there's a reason why people are diving into them they they know how to respond they know how to engage and you need to learn from that influencer so you know there's something to learn from everyone i think yeah oh guaranteed but even to your point like when you talk about like an athlete that's getting his hand held into a deal versus somebody that is authentically engaging and like they there's a meaning and a purpose to what they're doing and why they're doing it dude it just like that that's even more clear because even these people that are doing the wrong shit they authentically want to help people or look cool like whatever you know it just authenticity trumps yeah that's that's why that's why i think ryan is the best at it like ryan went and he bought rexham this this fifth tier football team and i don't know if you watched the documentary i mean the town was you know it was it was falling and it's and he came in there and he fell in love with the organization because he fell in love with the organization because he fell in love with the fans there was this true level of authenticity he was at games literally like guy didn't know three years ago. He didn't know what a, what a striker was on a football field. But it was like, that's you know, hilarious. Yeah. But that's, but that's the beauty of it. Now it's like you ain't, people are smart, man. You ain't, you ain't fooling them. Like it's you either come in here. If he was in there more concerned with, Oh, how many posts, none of that stuff is, is, is doing well. Yeah. Well, that, JJ's fallen his deal with, uh, I I'm, trash at european soccer teams but starts with a b i can't remember what team he he bought him his wife bought ownership into but he's doing he's doing the same thing went over there interacted with all the fans did a bar crawl like doing like the like but that's just kind of how he is when he does something he's all in and that's where like you see that shit ring true i i I mean from what i heard he's a good guy too so i mean i think that's oh yeah yeah he's a great he's i mean he's learned from some cool people in the celebrity world like how to establish boundaries and spend like this social equity that they have gained through the platform. But he, like, if you get in, like, he's a, an incredible human that just helps. So like, that's yeah. Nice. That's yeah. Nice. But uh, yeah, I mean, we can rant about all that stuff. Uh, we can start the formal side of this if you want to. I mean, listen, how I normally do the, what, every time. Uh, I, 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 fun. I, yeah. Fuck it. Yeah. I shoot from the hip and I mean, I give you, if I can include the, the, the gin story, that's still the, all the uh, me. Me attacking the sports industry and their coaching. That's 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 that shows up anyways on here. Just because like I, I have a bu- I've had a bunch of strength coaches on here. I've had Matt Winning, who I know you're doing an event with as well. Great guy. He's a, great. Big muscles and big brain on that human man. He's awesome. And just it's a it's really special paradox in him that it's uh, cool to see. I really liked him. Yeah, man. Let's just have fun. Yeah, and include that story. That's fine. I mean, yeah, cool. I, I think it's I think it's a great lesson. Right. Because the celebrity piece of it, I think it's more times less successful than it is successful. 
Because yeah, I'd, ag I'd agree, but they can always cover their losses. You, you don't track a brand for five years that was a flash in the pan where these people probably ate millions or the people that use them to get on the platform ate millions. Yeah, 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 it's true. It's so true. It, it gets tough, but like, uh, I mean, you're, like you're, I mean, obviously you've been in the industry for what, 20, 30 years at this point yeah. now? Closer, it's probably closer. I mean, professionally, it's uh, been about 25 but I got in the industry before that, you know, like you were an athlete, I was an athlete and you just, you start developing this obsession. You know, I went to school, I studied business, but I was kind of minoring in fitness in the back of my head when they didn't really have degrees in exercise science or exercise phys. I mean, I went off to get my master's degree in exercise uh, phys. And I remember I pulled out because I had an opportunity to now go and open my first club. And I was like, all right, well, this is going to be in my eyes, an education that I'll never learn at, at, you know, getting my master's degree. And, um, and I was right. I mean, you know, you get kicked in the face so much at a certain point, there's things that, you know, I, I always say, I'm like, I, I learned things that you can't teach at Harvard business school, right? There's, there's so much under the table nonsense going on and, and um, landlords and real estate attorneys and just how crooked this whole business can get. And, um, you know, fortunately I was able to exit from it very gracefully. I, um, you know, I, I moved on from my two clubs. I was in for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. My uh, 15 year lease expired May of 2020. And I was able to, you know, go into another business, which is still in what I've been doing, but I was able now to scale up to a level that I would have needed probably 10 clubs to be able to do it at that level. So um, it worked out great for me. Unfortunately, it didn't work out great for a lot of people in my industry, but you know, you know, it, it is. Yeah, and that uh, for those of you listening, uh, he's referring to Drive 495 in uh, Manhattan, is that where actually I met Don originally, uh, chasing uh, Charlie Weingraf up in there with one of an, another player who was working out of there. Um, I'll see Charlie tomorrow. I'll actually see him tomorrow. Let's go. I, did, I actually just uh, podcasted his wife, Allie. Yeah, she's um, awesome. Yeah, she's a, she's a monster. But, um, but then – now where everybody can find you and this will all be in the pod notes everybody but uh the challenges the programs the subscription you got the app now like the the scaling and the lightning rod that you become in the industry is so cool to see just because I, I watch from afar but like I, I admire the people that uh, one the consistency kills everything but when people truly enjoy like they look like they enjoy what they're doing and then obviously now to hear your mindset that you're still learning doing all the certifications like you're not stopping and even like like what we talked about with like the the engagement side learning that whole deal and learning from everybody is such a and it's just a humble approach it's like i can see really quick with people because like i just consider myself a constant learner and again i mean the, the, no matter how you want to look at it like you're if you want to be righteous you're comfortable with the sinners and the saints but you're not judging everybody when you meet them but so i just think the curious humans uh stand out well well said yeah, dude. So it's it's fun. So uh, usually, like we start the official podcast or like just the opening question is, where right now are you chasing edges? Uh, where are you learning? Where are you growing? Like, what's on on the forefront of your mind? Wow. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting because I did come from the brick and mortar space for a long time. I was, you know, working in gyms or working in one on one facilities or having my own facilities for the last, you know, twenty, you know, twenty plus years. And now to be able to kind of go out and, and do this from a very scalable, you know, uh, spot for, for me has become very special because my model was really working with a lot of these people to either get them ready for the field or get them ready for the movie screen. It's probably even more for the movie screen. I think I worked with more athlete, um, actors than I worked with athletes. And it was very niche, right? Everything was very individualistic. If there was an issue, Charlie was involved, right? We mentioned him. Yeah. We had our functional medicine doctor and then. If there was an injury, I'd have an MRI back in my hands within three hours. Like just to be able to have that access was incredible. But then realize that like there's only so many, it sounds corny, but it's only so many people you can change from that approach. So I, I think, you know, I launched my first challenge about seven years ago. It did very well, but I couldn't focus on it. I was literally, I had so much going on with my brick and mortar business. So I think when the pandemic hit and we were able to really kind of go out and start doing something that was non brick and mortar related. It's almost shocking when you can fully commit to something like what actually happens. And I see this when people get laid off, they're like, they're trying to double dip. And I'm like, either quit or get fired at some point, like you just move on. And then they end up exiting somehow. And then they're all in like their chips are all in. And then 
nine out of 10 times. So I'm like, damn, I should have done that earlier. Right. It's like, all right, man, like I totally get, it. but right now it's just continuing to scale our model. We probably have about 10,000 uh, people in our community now. Um, oh. you know, it's pretty dope. I mean, I'm, I'm hosting a retreat in uh, Mexico in July. It's a two week retreat. We got about 150 people coming from about 30 different countries, which I'm really proud of. It's our third annual. And, um, yeah, just um, continue to build product with some really special companies and continue to grow my community and, you know, continue to do the things I love, which is coach. Oh, dude, that's awesome. I mean, there's a bunch of cool messages in there. Uh, first off, where's, uh, Where's the retreat? Because it's a it's a fitness retreat. It's yeah. it's Don Con. Is that what it's called? Uh, yeah, I didn't think of that name by the way. Yeah. Like, oh, Don Con. I'm like, no, it wasn't yeah. my idea. It was I I spoke at Comic Con I think seven or eight years ago. Um, I gave a talk in about it in front of eight thousand people, and when I was standing on the stage, I looked down. And I realized I was like, holy shit! Right around the time where I launched that first um, challenge, and I was like, wait, this is my customer avatar. Like this. I train the Ryan Reynolds and the Blake Livelys and the Andy Hathaways. I work with these people, but my customer avatar really is the Comic-Con person. So when I launched my first retreat, I almost kind of knew what I was getting into because half the people were like, oh, I heard from you from Ryan. And I'm like, oh, how about that? Right? Like, thanks, buddy. I can't tell you how many thank you messages that I sent Ryan and Blake over that, you know, that, that first year. Um, I still thank them. Um, but, you know, I... Uh, that customer avatar being that Comic-Con person, I had some people came uh, turn around and say, you know what, Don Con should be, you know, you should host a retreat called Don Con. And I said, all right, like, this is, this is kind of cool. Let's see where this ends up going. And, um, you know, that, the rest is history. Hell yeah. I mean, you're out there building superheroes, at least establishing <laughs> some of the DNA necessary for it, you know? It's fun. <laughs> the retreat space like i think it's so cool that you're doing that in general because the connections i've made whether it's been um xpt i've done a bunch of breathing retreats in general just to like learn learn in general but then the lifestyle around it then i coach at retreats now like breath works on ice and just the the humans and the mindsets that you again you're grabbing from all over the country and in your case all over the world like it's so cool to like start I don't know, like, uh, I got, I always relate it to like, find, like, find your pool. I was at Laird and Gabby's and this, the writer of uh, Braveheart was in the sauna and basically goes through this bit that like, he like stops me before I get out. He goes, everybody in that pool, the, the world outside thinks they're crazy, but everybody here supports that and cultivates it. He goes, when you leave here, you need to go find your pool. And I think retreats do that in this way where you find a lot of like-minded humans that are like that you were the lightning rod for, but you're, we're still talking about health, fitness, well, like all these things that are true magic and like the realm of human, human performance. And like, I just, I think, uh, whatever growth is the, is the medicine for humans any, anyways, at this point now, you know, I, I had a, I had a client of mine, his name is Billy Crudup. He's a, he's an actor. He was in uh, without limits. One of my favorite movies in this movie called almost famous and one of a huge Broadway actor, one of my favorite people I've ever worked with. And uh, he told me he went out to Laird and Gabby's and uh, went through that, um, you know, I think went through like a day with, with them. And yeah, birds of a feather. It's like, you know, from the outside, you can look in. You used to hear Arnold saying this, like Arnold would say, you know, people look at bodybuilders in the 70s and they're like, you know, how strange is that? Like, you're right. It's, you know, how weird. But when you get into that community, you really have the sense of like feeling like you're home. And I, I think I even get that a lot now with friends of mine. Like some of my best friends are my training partners, right? One of them has been my training partner for 19 years. Uh, Let's go. Like one of the most in shape, you know, 61 year old black guys. He's just shredded to the bone. And, you know, he's doing pull-ups with 200 pounds around his waist at 61. And he's literally like my brother. And, 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 when I met him, he said something to me and it was a, uh, it was a line that I'll never forget. He goes, listen, man, this is part of my survival. And I just kind of stopped and I looked at him and I immediately understood what he was saying. He wasn't saying like, oh, I'm a tough guy or, oh, I'm training for, to have big muscles. Our training, the people I surround myself with. Yeah. Like if you, if you develop a bicep and you look good and you have single digit body, that's all great for us. It's hundred percent about this. And I think that's why we found a level of success in this in this industry, because we're not sitting there obsessing over a scale or a body fat percentage, right? I'm obsessing more over a process and I'm obsessing more over how can I feel great today? Did I go in the day? Did I, have I eaten, you know, so far I've had three great meals. Awesome, right? I'll probably have to, I'll have two more. Like, did I have a great training session? Absolutely. Was my mobility on check? Absolutely. 
you know, am I going to maybe mix some recovery in there? Probably it's going to happen. Am I going to get a good night's sleep tonight? Yes. And if I can keep checking those boxes every day, I'm in a really good place mentally. Now, am I going to have those occasional weekends where, you know, I went to Austria with some friends, we snowboarded for seven days, a couple beers every day, was not counting my macros. Did I give a shit? No, that's part of the program. I came back. I felt great about it. I was motivated. I start back. And did it take me a week to get back? No, it took me one session because the second I got back in and I trained and I was started hydrating and I started eating, I was like, I'm back. I wasn't looking at like, Oh, I'm holding water. Like I'm not competing. That's not what I care about for me. It's a mindset. So when my buddy told me that years ago, something clicked and now I've got more in common with him than, you know, than anyone else. Yeah, that's I, I just like the the suffering with people in general. Sears like such a cool relationship and positive reinforcement and that in that sense too. But the big thing I love there because I, I I try and harp on it and coach it all the time is feel. Like how far away are people from feel right now? Because like it, it's such a sh- subjective thing that's handcuffed by vocabulary and all this stuff too. But like I'm more worried about your baseline, like. Do you know what 100, 95%, 90% feels like? And I would argue that the majority of people don't. And like, obviously you can look at obesity rates and all these other things in the country, but I have like my athletes track, like all their subjective feelings to some extent, as far as like more energy and focus as opposed to anything. But you start to see these trends. If you track, I think the most important metric is your feel. And it's like, your watch can't track that. Like your, like your heart rate monitor can't track that. It can tell you ballpark maybe but um I, I like that you you go by feel and you know but you obviously experience incredible the the you reap the rewards of incredible habits recovery all these things over the years where you've generated this baseline that is i think non-negotiable at this point 100 percent. and listen i still like yeah am i measuring my sleep no yeah, they're, no. they're great tools yeah those are tools. But at the end of the day, I think people start obsessing so much over those and the numbers. Like, to be honest, like heart rate variability, it's a real thing. Yeah. It is. It's, it's a real thing. I get it. If I'm waking up on a Tuesday and I'm training with my team and my HRV is a little low and I feel great, like I'm not backing off, man. Yeah. It, ain't, it ain't happening. Like, well, I'm traveling Wednesday. Well, I'm not going to be able to do what I needed. Like, no, I'm going after it. And, you know, I, I think at a certain point, we get all this technology and all this feedback. There was a time where that didn't exist and people were just fine. And yeah. They, and they were still like, and they were able to get to their goals and get to a certain level. And I also think sometimes like we start society, I'm sorry to say this, get, get a little soft, you know, it's like, all right, like they're, they're, they're a little soft. I was looking at someone recently who came in one of my challengers and she came into the barn. She wanted to get a workout in. I was here doing some work and I looked over and I'm like, where do you rate? I'm just curious. You're a treadmill walk right now on a scale of one to 10. What are you, what are you putting that at, at this as? She's like a 10. And I just, I, I didn't want to beat her up on it, but I turned around and I was like, I know that's what you're feeling or you think you're feeling, but not a, not a 10, right? It's, it's, you know, you're probably more at a three or four. And, you know, we start trying to nitpick. Oh, well, I soak my almonds in water to release the phytic acid and arsenic. I'm like, listen, start working hard. (laughs) Yeah. Like we need to start, like we just put the cart before the horse sometimes and we start listening what a lot of gurus are talking about. And I think it's taking away from, you know, hard work, discipline, resting and recovering is part of hard work. Like that's part of your hundred percent or that's part of what you need to do. Like the breath work, all that stuff that you're talking about, like that stuff's magic. Right. But everyone wants things in the form of a pill, unfortunately. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's, it's tough to see that going there, but I, I, like, I mean, I, I can rant on this stuff all day where it's just like, we're, we're talking about like, cause I, in my world, like CO2 tolerance is re- really important, but like, I, I understand like, that bleeds into everything in life. Cause now like my message is tolerance, like build your tolerance, build your tolerance to pain, doubt, fear, whatever, like what have you. And that feedback's a big one. I don't think people have high feedback tolerance anymore particularly for negative feedback, which is like coincidentally the most effective way to improve is criticism and feedback. And part of the whole, the the whole engagement world is putting stuff out there to get feedback. And again, maximize the feedback loops, create the best product, whatever it ends up being, but people 
don't like negative feedback right now too. So anyway, so the, this whole world, like where, but you, you need to know where people are gauging themselves. And I think the, like, it's such a subtle tool, but the one to 10 on people's scales, particularly for humans that, I mean, everybody's experience are different. Everybody scales are different. Our relationship with every word on the planet's different, but to find out where somebody's at right now, and then hopefully train their tolerance different places, I think is always a fun and fun endeavor. A hundred percent. I mean, listen, I sell programs online, right? But like, are those programs complete? And the answer is, you know, I don't mean a bad, I mean, I'm not bashing my own program, but no, it's, it's not. Cause when you're looking at, you know, I'm selling Deadpool program right now, Ryan Reynolds program, like, well, what intensity did Ryan train at? Okay. What intensity are you training at? And what intensity should you be training at? Hmm. Like there's just different things here. So when you open up a magazine, you see Ronnie Coleman, four sets of 15. Well, I'm sure his approach to that is a little bit different than your approach to that. Right. And is that program really, um, is that a finalized program in my book? And the answer is no, because there's so many things where there's so many questions that we're not asking and um, you know, intensity is a big one. And then when we ask it, how they might quantify it and how you might quantify it, I can almost guarantee you're two totally different things. Yeah, it's fine. Well, like even to your point with the, the watches and the recovery scores and like, like I do think in that sense, like, because intensity is a little different. Like I, I understand the problem with like reading a magazine and seeing Ronnie Coleman's numbers and like, oh, I can do that. And I go and do his stuff for a few weeks and it just destroys me. Well, he's also recovering like a pro. He's supplementing properly. He's doing who knows what else, but like doing, taking care of business when you have to go do your nine to five on top of training like a savage and those kind of things. But I look at the, like it's, it's back to your point where like, like you, regardless of the fact you need to do hard work, and you can't let your watch because you're choosing to sleep and not hydrate and nutrition like properly in that sense. You like if because if you give people a crutch, they'll use it. And if if your crutch is I'm not a hundred percent, well, in sports, majority of the time you're never playing at a hundred percent, let alone but now it's just like, yeah, I don't think we need as much of those metrics. And I think we just need more feel just to get back to to the message. Totally agree with you, hundred percent. Yeah. Well, so, uh, I mean, I, there's, there's a lot of stuff that, uh, I want to start touching on a little bit, but I mean, we've already kind of overscaled some of it or overviewed on some of it, but how has your training philosophy changed over the years, whether it's training recovery? Um, cause I mean, you've been like throwing punches for 20 years, obviously so many things have come in and out of style, but is there some principles that you just like hold true with, uh, your humans? Yeah, I, I think I've become less rigid where like, I'll never forget, like back in the day, like the template, like, oh, we wouldn't break the template, right? Like I was the guy who was traveling, you know, on vacation with my wife to Mexico and we had a beautiful gym in the hotel and I would be, you know, jumping in a car service and driving 30 minutes to some dump gym because I'm like, oh, like they didn't have X, Y, and Z, right? Like, I, so I think there was this level of like, uh, of me being rigid, that back then where I think now I've learned to relax a little bit more. Now I like mapping out my programming. I normally assign templates to people, but the thing I'm doing with templates is I tell them um, that, you know, templates, you know, you need to call audibles, right? Like you just need to. And, and, you know, if you are doing a, a percentage program, like, you know, it's probably not going to travel well with you. Like, let me just break it. Like there's things that you have to. So I think just like that rigidness that I, that I once had, now I think I've learned to relax a little bit more. Um, I also know there's so many tools in the toolbox. And, um, but you, you know, great, you know, I'm really thankful that when I did start off, I think I took my first job as a, as a, as a trainer back in, you know, 98, 99, right around that year. I, um, you know, I, I knew a lot about it already. I think where things really changed for me was, you know, throughout the years, you start paying more attention and it was only a couple of years in the more unilateral work. Right. It's like, Oh, the importance of that. Like I didn't learn that in 2020. I learned that in probably 2000. Right. So there were just things I also understood back then that the fluffiness of certain exercises just wasn't necessary. Well, there's someone squatting on a BOSU ball there yet. They can't do a goblet squat properly. Like, that doesn't make sense to me. I think I just knew that early on. These things were just, it was a very common sense approach for me that like, wait, we need to get good at one. 
you know, do we even need to do the other? You know, not really my training style. Not saying it's a bad thing, just not my training style. So, um, yeah, I think just, I mean, understanding practice and understanding that every human body, you know, responds differently to different things. I think, you know, the the one term I always use was practice. Like some people call it their warm up, and you know that got bashed. And then you heard prehab, and that got bashed. And you heard movement prep, and that got prep bashed. Like I call it practice because every one of us needs to work on different things. You might be lacking in thoracic extension. I might be lacking in thoracic rotation. So if I'm not, you know, lacking in thoracic extension, then why am I going to pound that, right? Like that's not something that I might need. I just might need more thoracic rotation. So I, so I think understanding practice and understanding, you know, what that individual needs is something that I think I've become very, very good at over the last several decades of coaching. And um, I, I think the thing that I'm probably, and I don't mean to toot my own horn here, but exceptional at is that um, I could take anyone and within the hour, they'll leave here feeling like a different person, a different mindset. And it's not about beating them up, right? It's about taking someone with no confidence. How do you give them confidence? It's about someone who's you know coming in and going through a screening and they're feeling down on themselves. And how do you kind of divert them in another direction where you leave them feeling like that they were successful, not feeling down? Because most people are coming in here very vulnerable and they're coming in here feeling insecure. And that's really what I, I think I was always been great at was just giving them the ability to make sure that they always felt like they were being successful. Even mm -hmm. when they were coming hammered to shit and they're like, well, we're supposed to do max fives today on the trap bar. And like, well, what happened last night? Well, I flew in from Singapore and I got shit faced on the plane and have you drank much water. No, my wife was yelling at me this morning. Like, listen, man, like got some things working in our, against us today. Let's hit those max fives in a day or so. And Let's come in with what I like to call my post-playing workout. Totally made up name, right? It was yeah. Okay, like, let's do it. And then you allow them to leave and you allow them to feel successful. So I think that's with experience. That's where I evolved to, you know, from the 20, 21 year old trainer to now I'm 46 years old. It's like, that's what you develop over time. It's just that level of confidence that, you know, you can work with anyone at any level and let them feel successful. That's a really, I mean, that's just a really cool quality just as a human listening to another human here. Um, can you, can you give an example of like somebody, uh, a new person walking in and still being able to breed that confidence through the vulnerability? Yeah, actually a guy started, I, I, you know, got so many of them, but the most, I think the most recent was a guy I was introduced to back in May. Cause I'm not doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one training anymore. Right. Like I work with a few celebrities all the one-on-one -on -one training I do is really charity. Um, so I have regulars throughout the week that come in here that couldn't afford it, that I allow to come in here and I work with for free. And uh, we've, you know, they've become like family. So um, I had a guy who came into me back in May and I actually have his sheets on my wall right here. And I, I kind of created this calendar for him and I'll explain why. He started at, uh, I met him, uh, a friend of a friend his name was John, and I talk about him on social media. He was 525 pounds, and mm. uh, he was walking four to 600 steps a day with canes. And um, we got, you know, we're both Italian, so we kind of had, like, I met him. He's really into that. So he sat down on my couch right here, and we just had a conversation. And I'll never forget it. I, I said, John, let's start right now. And he said, all right, well, what do you want to do? I'm like, just, just talk to me. And we stood up. And we started walking around and I timed them. And the time was 10 minutes and three seconds. Never forget it. And I held up my phone and I have a journal on here. I could show you every day that we've worked together. I said, John, look, 10 minutes and three seconds. We just were able to do work. Can you come back tomorrow? He's like, sure. And he came back tomorrow and it was 1144. And the next day was like 15 and change. And the next day was like 18 and change. Well, fast forwarding now. The last three weeks that he's we've accumulated steps, he's had his three biggest weeks in the last year. His biggest week was now four to 600 steps. Let's call it 600 times seven is 4,200 steps a week at best. Two weeks ago, he had 44,581 steps. Let's go. <laughs> the week before that, he had 44,229 steps. And last week, he had an off week at 42,793. And we have on here, we have, we have checks and the checks mean days he made into the gym. So in the last month he missed one, two, three, four, missed about five days coming in here. Then the workouts became the cable system. 
well, why the cables? Well, because we couldn't lay him down. We couldn't get him on a bench. We couldn't get him on the machines. He was too big. So standing cables, using a suspension trainer, teaching him to squat using a suspension trainer. Then in time, learning to walk the stairs. The first time I got him down the staircase here, it took us, uh, I think it took us about 10 minutes. Mm. And I'm walking him down and I'm like, oh my God, I fucked up, man. This is like, I'm like, I'm literally doubting myself. I got my hand on his chest. He's out of breath. We got him down there. We moved around. I'm sorry, walking him up the stairs took him over 10 minutes. Walking down was a little easier. And then um, recently he ran up the flight of stairs in 13 seconds. Let's go. Let's go. So, so he's down a hundred pounds now, which is good. Um, he said something to me recently that for me summed it up. This is why I know he's going to continue to be successful and he's going to be more successful. We hit our one year anniversary. And I said, listen, do you want to go to the hospital and get your way in? Cause in the beginning he wanted a way in like all the time. He weighed in one week, lost like 30 pounds in 10 days, which we know is not real weight. He went back a week later, gained 17 with back, and he went down this tailspin. And we had a long talk about NSVs, non-scale victories. And I turned to him, I go, do you want to go for your weigh-in? And he goes, no. I go, interesting. I go, why not? He goes, I feel so good right now that no matter what the number says, I know it's going to disappoint me, and I just want to focus on the process. But bro, I was sitting there, I had like tears in my eyes. I was like, oh, it's like this freaking epiphany. And that for me was what I want any person that I work with. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's Ryan Reynolds. I don't care if it's someone who's just getting started. <laughs> I worked with a woman who is, I'm still working with her. She started with me at 872 pounds, 872. And she's down to just breaking below 400, but mm -hmm. the weight's not still coming off. We're having, you know, months where she goes up 20 and she comes down and it's a battle. This is not always going to be easy. This is not always going to be that story where they're showing on P90X where, oh, well, so-and-so did X. Fine. Sometimes that happens, but most times people want to want it. They just, they really struggle for that motivation. So if we can fix this, we work on this, everything else is going to fall into in the place. So that to me was a very challenging story because everything had to be a, a little bit unorthodox. Like what we had to do was focus on just walking. And then I got him an aura and now he's measuring through aura and now he's, you know, now every day it's, you know, steps now, you know, the other day he's inclined pressing fifties for, you know, for 15 reps and, you know, he's going through workouts on his own and he's sweating and he's out of breath. We still got work to do, but that to me is a really interesting story. I work with someone else who was um, a, a, a bomb victim. He was, um, I worked with him out in uh, California and it was um, a course I was taking and um, he was, um, involved in a bombing the guy was blown up and he could hardly move and our workout you know resulted around two movements it literally was i mean it was like a plank and uh i think it might have been like a plank and uh it was a kettlebell course it was a plank and maybe a um uh, a goblet squat something so simple but we went through our movement i didn't have a full injury history on him but i got the okay at this course and i was allowed to work with him it was a waiver and we went in and i showed him that these are the two movements that i'm going to teach you to become very successful at today and we worked on those two movements and the guy was overjoyed by the end of the workout like what are we trying to do here like am i going to fix this guy's problems in one session no what is my objective with that session one not to scare the shit out of him right not in this order of course not to hurt him right? It's probably my first. Two is not to scare the shit out of him. And three is to allow him to leave here with some confidence. Because are they going to lose it? He's going to drop body fat in that session. Is he going to really get that much stronger? No. But your first experience with someone, you have a you have a big responsibility as a coach. My first session with people is normally very like underwhelming. Like it's not like people come into me and they're like, they're scared shitless. They're like, I actually joked around. I was teaching a class at the Yaman Yara. I got brought in there a few years ago and I walked into a bachelorette party. I, I got hired in to come in and do like five sessions for the whole week. It's a great deal for me and my family. It's like a free vacation. But I came in one day, I looked at these 13 women. They were sitting there and they were like this. I had my sunglasses on. I was in a tank top, got in front of them. I looked at them and I go, ladies, welcome to hell. Just like a dead straight face. And they were like, I just saw one woman go. I just started laughing. No, you're not getting that today. Like the idea today, we're going to break a sweat. We're going to move. I'm going to learn about how you move a little bit. Any injuries here? You're pregnant. Okay, let's talk. And on a scale of one to 10, I probably ran him at a six and a half, a six, six and a half. 
And they left with a very responsible session and they were excited and they were happy and no one got hurt. And I moved on and I never saw any of them again because I'm there for as a, you know, I'm there as a hired gun for one session. Mm -hmm. But like, what am I trying to do? If I go in there as a coach and I try and beat the living crap out of someone, I feel like I'm doing them an injustice. And I, and I think it's irresponsible. Now you want to talk about mental toughness. That's fine. But I don't know the individual. I don't know who I'm working with. I don't know if they're having heart issues. Even if I chose a responsible cardio exercise, like an airdyne bike, like pretty low skill, pretty easy to push someone on. I don't know what they're, because most of the time these people don't want to tell you. They fill, fill out that injury form and, oh, really? You, you had a stint put in your heart? Like you forgot to tell me about that. You, you, oh, sorry. I didn't think it was important. No, it's very important. <laughs> it's like, okay. So um, I think as a, as a coach, we have a responsibility to, um, to, uh, to push people in the direction of really enjoying it and building their confidence over time. Well, um, so dang cool, dude. Like the, and, uh, I, I won't get too esoteric on it, but it just, um, the f one, I mean, the, the, all your stories, the fact that you meet people where they're at and just that again, feeling of success is priceless. And it's like, I, I see you the, again, not to attack CrossFit or these other places where they come in and they beat you up. And like, I, I even in my world argue that everybody should know how to have like a fundamental breathing pattern before you even start to like compound respiratory rate and heart rate. But um, in that realm, like meeting somebody where they're at is so special to me that uh, like, and I'm not trying to get emotional on it, but like the, the guy, you change the guy's metric in his head you change the identity of the number on the scale to how he felt and that trumped it. And that's so like, that's just, dude, that's it builds, confidence. it builds confidence. And like, I'm not worried about the mental toughness piece. Like I've, I've, I've been in training sessions where I've had blood coming out of my nose. Like people, I would never recommend people to do things that I've done from a high intensity training standpoint. Wouldn't recommend it. That's part of me. That's part of my identity. That's part of what I enjoyed for years. And um, I'm not saying it has to be like that for me all the time now. No, that's probably another thing that I really learned about coaching, where you would come in and beat yourself to a point where you'd have to lay down for two hours and you couldn't walk. Like that's, yeah, maybe not the best approach. But for me, it was less about the physique. And it was more about that mental piece of pushing yourself. And, and that taught me a lot. But most people out there, they don't need it. It's I, I, I understand that consistency is going to trump intensity until you get consistent and then it's time to be consistently more intense. It's like, it's just kind of a line I've always been been using, but um, you know, it, it's, it's unfortunate because more people get scared from bad experiences and more people get pushed away where I feel like a coach, you know, are you training someone or are, you, are they working out? It's like two different things. Like mm. sometimes yeah. I'll go for a mindless run where I'm like, all right, listen, uh, I got to go for, you know, heart rate 40 minutes. Keep that, make sure the heart rate's between 130 and 150. Stay more zone two. Stay in there. Try and keep the foot on the brakes a little bit. Let's cruise. Know why you're doing this today. And there's other times where I'm running like us. I feel like there's a gang running after me with an ax. Like it's just like, it's all right. But, you know, we need more of the first recommendation for people build up it's easy it's really easy in my opinion to motivate someone if you show them progress if someone's not motivated it's probably because it's such a struggle from i think a poor approach that you know as a coach you got to ask yourself are you doing the right thing by this person and if you can slowly give them small dosages and show them some progress without showing them that they have to kill themselves they're going to turn around and the magic words are what's what's next i mean that to me is pretty special yeah, and just not to like go zero to sixty and have them sore for the next three days, like like gentle, like relative soreness, but not to the point where like you can't walk. Because I've seen that, I've seen all that stuff happen too. Or again, CrossFit community, they're doing a lift that they're not again well versed in, where very complex movements and injuries occur and all these other things. But um, b besides the point, I, I don't want to I don't want to gloss over your approach as practice, like the warm up, the training, like. Because uh, that's why I, I love yoga in that sense that it's always a practice. And I think we're, I mean, like we're, all, there's a, there's a dynamite quote where it's like, we're all amateurs at something we'll never become masters at like life. Like nobody masters life in that sense, not Elon Musk, nobody on the planet. Everybody's just doing their best. 
and winging it for the most part, which is cool. But that kind of ties into your your coaching method and from just like an outsider looking in where you're meeting somebody where they're at. And this again, this will all tie together, I think. Um, so you have the ability to adapt. So like the post the post plane workout, like those kind of things, like again, you're sustaining and being consistent with the feeling of success, which is the end result, which is actually progress. Cause really if you're coming in crazy stress, like you're not gonna get the same adaptation anyways. Right. And that adaptability that you create by meeting them where they're at doesn't make them a slave to the routine. And something that we talk about on here a lot, just because I was, when I played, I was so rigid that it, like, it, I don't even know, bubble wrapped me from life. And like, I wouldn't let girls stay over because it was like, it would mess up my sleep patterns. Like, yeah. I'd have to cook by myself because people would try and influence my diet, like, all these things. I wouldn't go out because I, I needed to control my diet. Just, not good and then we functioned off the once i learned what i was doing and that like i need to insert life and chaos and enjoyment um things got better but it's like do you own the routine or is the routine on you and that's where I, somebody dropped that on me um a while back and i just go i've been i've been a slave to the routine since i can remember also you were a world-class athlete so you got we got to ask ourselves too like what are you training for right like when someone yeah. comes like and it gets to that line when someone's like, oh, well, my doctor said I can have a glass of wine a night. I'm like, okay, like, do I think alcohol is good for you? No, it's not. It's, 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 I, and, and if I'm going to have something, and this isn't off topic here, there's a, yeah. there, there's a reason for me saying this. If someone's like, well, you don't drink, like, if I'm out drinking, like, I'll, I'll have a beer. Well, it's got gluten in it. You're right. It does have gluten in it. Well, uh, it's not clear. You're right. It's not clear. Well, it might be higher calorie. You're right. It is higher calorie. Well, why are you doing it? I'm like, cause there's less alcohol in it, it's going to hit me less. I'm going to drink less of it. I'll enjoy it. I'll sip it. I like the taste of it. If I drink tequila, uh, you know, it goes down quick and there might be a chance I'm running around, you know, someone's house naked at a certain point, right? It's like bad things are going to happen. Right. So, yeah. you know, I, I think it's all, and, and by the way, I don't do it enough to where it matters. I don't care about the calories from alcohol. Like when someone's asking me about the calories from alcohol, I'm like, well, how much do you drink? Well, once a month, don't worry about it. Well, I had one margarita. Don't worry about it. You're, you're fine. Well, I drink four nights a week. Well, what are you drinking? Tequila. I don't care what you're drinking. It's four nights a week. It's yeah. like you're putting alcohol in your system. Well, it has no calories. Well, it's damaging hormone function. It's ruining your sleep quality. In time, you will. Like, it's got nothing to do with the calories. What is it doing to everything else? So I think sometimes we hear like, all right, so-and-so, the doctor said I can have this. or there's antioxidants in wine. I love that one, right? Like suddenly it's this powerful antioxidant that's going to suddenly heal you. When I'm prepping for the cover of muscle and fitness, no, I can't have alcohol. I can't. And I have to weigh all my food. Yes, I yes, I do. And am I slave to the scale? But I enjoy it. Yeah. You know, like I'm at the point now where I've been on a dozen covers. I feel best when I'm prepping. I really do. Because there's like, oh, um, cheat meals are gone. Inflammation's gone. Body looks the best. Sleep quality is at its highest. There's no congestion. You know, coming off of Memorial Day, was I at a barbecue last night? Sure. Did I eat some things that maybe I wouldn't eat? Sure. Am I a little stuffy today? Yes. I'll get over it. But I think we also have to understand what we're training for. You, like what I respect with what you did was you knew you were trying to go at a certain level and you were one of those people that said, and I can tell you're like this, I want to do everything in my power to give myself the best chance. And back then, that's what you knew. Now, the main question is, was, would you have been better off if you'd maybe relaxed a little bit more? I don't know. Or like when I was in college playing ball, baseball, I had to be practicing all the time. I turned to one of our best players on the team. I'm like, man, if you practice half as much as I would be, like, could you imagine how good you would be? He goes, Don, if I practice how much is uh, half as much as you would be that you were, I would suck because I would just take the game too seriously. And I can't be, this is a game for, for me. Like you weren't around one of those athletes that just played and hardly practiced and just had that talent. Right. So we're all built a little bit differently. That's why we'll never know. And don't look. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's well, it's fun. Like, cause like I, I coach off of my experience and like, that's all we can do in general. And it's like, okay. Like what, like even in my sport, like the only thing I knew was workhorse control as much as possible when really like there's, there's levels to the control you can have on the football field. Cause competition's chaos. Life is chaos where yeah. you have to be meet yourself where you're at obviously like breathing helped me from overthinking, get out of your head, get into your physiology, get into your feel, all these things. And yeah, there, there's room for 
little softer edges and more flow. But at the end of the day, like, like the workhorse got me there and it's going to keep me there until I learn different. And so in that sense, it's like, I need to know which human I am. And then even when you start getting into training, like MMA, like you, my UFC guys, and like, they only know the workhorse side. They don't know the racehorse. Like, how do I peak? Like how do like in, in essence, that kind of thing. And I think you see that a lot in sports and life in general, where it's like all go, go, go. And really like it's balance and this, this whole thing's an art form. Cause it is person to person, everybody, like you've been in a scenario where you have 30 people doing your program. They all react differently. And, and so when people, the same as when people look at these programs, like I'm not going to get the Ronnie Coleman results, I'm going to get my results and that's okay. As long as I'm successful and seeing progress, like that's the goal. And I, I think that's really cool. hundred percent. And I, I love your thought process with, with all this. Fantastic. Well, yeah. well, I mean, you've lived it, learned it and can articulate the hell out of it. It's cool. I just think uh, your coaching lessons just, I think can, can be spread and absorbed in such a cool way because right. Again, when I travel, I always stop in at gyms and th just I just watch and I'd run my own case studies and I see what I would do different versus like what are the human aspects here and like what like what's the culture like what are the are the can you even tell if there's positive energy negative energy or people are just mindlessly going through this and checking out and saying bye and even just in my short stint at uh, four ninety five the two times I stopped in there to just the interactions between the humans in there positive really cool to see um good people, good, good, good people. it was just like it, it, and that's why you fit in there so well right it was just you got around people there was no agenda and everyone in there i think naturally wanted to see everyone do well and i think that's a special that's a special place to be around yeah that's dynamite and then i don't want to take up too much of your time but one last question uh we kind of already touched it because you've gotten so much advice and you've given so much advice, but uh, the best advice you've received or that you've been, or that you give these days. You know what? I'll never forget it, man. Uh, when I opened my first gym back in 2005, uh, this guy, Pat Manakia, he was the owner of La Palestra. I haven't spoken to him in years. Brilliant, brilliant coach. Um, he, he said, it, it sounds so stupid. He said, man, be patient. Mm. And I kind of looked at him and, you know, in the back of my head, I kind of rolled my eyes at the time because I was young. But thinking about it now, we got to be patient in everything we do, right? You got to be patient in business. You got to be patient with your body. You got to be patient with relationships. You know, even if you're building your book, if you're a coach on here right now, do you know, I've, I've done more free sessions than most coaches have ever trained in their life. Mm -hmm. And I've done more free sessions where I've gotten nothing in return. It's like at a certain point, certain things are going to hit, they're going to stick, do it for the right reasons. But I think this level of patience, you have to develop over time. And I think with patience comes um, another word that I love, it's, and that's nurturing relationships, right? And I think you need to be patient to nurture relationships because, you know, if you're coming in and you're trying to prove someone on one session, which I see a lot of coaches doing, and I'm sitting in the corner like, oh God please just stop and just, just, just ask the right questions and deliver the right advice. And if you don't know the answer, just say, I don't know. And just be a, a little more calm, a little more genuine. Nurturing relationships take patience and it takes a good person to do. A lot of us who got involved in this field, you know, it wasn't to become billionaires, right? Like we got involved in this field because we loved it. We loved a certain feeling and you can't ever lose track of that. I think fortunately, some of us end up doing very well financially. But even when you're doing well financially, don't ever forget where you came from. I'll never forget the fact that I was cleaning up weights at Equinox back in 99. And I loved it. And anytime to this day, I'm able to help someone, I still get the same feeling I got when I first did this. And um, just follow that passion and purpose, no matter what you're doing in life, follow that passion and purpose, be patient, be patient with yourself, be patient with people and nurture those relationships and you'll go far in my opinion dude yeah that's dynamite I, I always uh i always pump the times of variable yeah because it, it's something like in the we want everything right now we want the we talked about it what you i want the pill instead of the work i want the pill instead of like understanding and feeling my pain or all these other things there's more rants inside of there but um I, i'm just a bit believer that like time is such the overlooked variable and like you can't go through time without patience when you're expecting results and it's really can't even expect the results if the process is clean and 
um, the purpose and the authenticity and ge genuine good human is there, dude. Things show up, and obviously, it's uh, working out for you. Um, I appreciate it, man. You're an absolute stud. Thank you for taking the time. I'll I'll link I'll link uh, the social, the app, everything uh, below. But if uh, anywhere, uh, what's the easiest place for people to find you there before we Thank get off you. here? Thank you. Uh, Don Saladino on uh, Instagram or donsaladino.com. Um, if you do do a post or anything, let yep. me know. I'll accept collaborator if you want. And cool. you know, uh, I think a lot of my people, I'd love them to see what you're doing. Um, you, you know, I would love to see, uh, have them see what you're doing from the breathing and the mindset piece. Let me know now how I can help. Like if I'll obviously promote all this. I mean, this is, this is, this is a great episode. I love talking to you, by the way. It's, it's just hey, same. Very... When you come out here, man, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do a training session, sauna, plunge. I'll have some food brought in. It'll feel like a vacation. If you need a place to stay one night, don't even book a hotel. If you're coming out to Hofstra, let's just make it fun. I'll give hey, you a, and, uh, man.